This class is entitled In Love for Life, Building or Rebuilding a Great Marriage, lesson number 13, the last in this series, uh, volume if you wish. Uh, and the title of this particular lesson is Keeping Your Spouse Happy. Keeping Your Spouse Happy. And if you have Bibles, you want to follow along, I'll be throwing up the scriptures on the screen, but if you prefer looking in your Bibles, one passage that we will be looking at is 1 Peter chapter 3. So if you prefer reading out of your Bibles, 1 Peter chapter 3. And speaking of Peter and speaking of marriage, believe it or not, you can find a bridge between these two. Um, because I think that Peter the Apostle, you know, he was a, 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 an Apostle of Jesus, but I also think that he was a happily married man. Peter was, was happy. And I think that he must have had a happy wife because he writes so knowingly about the formula for a happy marriage. Now I believe he was inspired by the Holy Spirit in his writing, of course, but I suspect that much of what he wrote was true and was true in his own marriage. In other words, through the power of the Spirit, he's writing about marriage. And I think what he writes about, he also experiences. And for that reason, I believe that he was, he was a happy husband, his wife was a happy wife. So in 1 Peter chapter 3, he talks about the things that couples need to do to keep each other, to keep each other happy in marriage. And he begins by speaking to wives about keeping their husbands happy. And he mentions in this passage three basic things to keep your wife, uh, to keep your husband happy. So I'll talk to the girls and I'll talk to the guys because that's what he does. He starts with the girls, he talks with the guys. Okay, so happy husbands. You want to keep a happy husband, number one, he says, assume a role that is pleasing to him. And he says in 1 Peter 3 verse 1, he says, in the same way you wives be submissive to your own husbands so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. And so you would kind of put these ideas together, submissive wives make for happy husbands. Now the term, you know, we use that a lot in the church, uh, the term Submission, we're in submission to God, of course. It's a military term here in the Greek, the term that he uses. It means to place oneself under, to understand you know, the lay of the land, the how things work, and to place oneself under. And it's not popular in this day's culture, but we need to recognize that everybody in life has to submit to a higher authority it's a fact of life without which there would be no peace. I mean, what's the opposite of a peaceful society? Anarchy. And what happens when there's anarchy in society? Well, everybody's fighting against everybody. We, we discount the rules of law, the government, whatever. It's anarchy, it's chaos. But in a society, in a well-ordered society, you know, uh, we're in submission to the laws and so on and so forth. The politicians are in submission to the people who elect them, you know, in a perfect, in a perfect situation, there is submissiveness. So within the context of marriage, God has given the leadership role, not superior, but leadership role to the man, whether he's a Christian or not. And one of the wife's goals in marriage is to help the man assume and exercise his role properly. <clears throat> it's not just a question of, okay, you know, you're the boss and I, you know, I take orders. That's, you know, maybe that's in the military, but that's not in the marriage. You know, a big problem is when a, a strong woman, for example, strong character, assertive woman, there's nothing wrong with that, but if a woman like that takes over the leadership of the marriage from a weak man, rather than helping him take on his natural role of leadership. Now this role doesn't mean that, as I say, one is superior or more valuable than another. It only means that we have different functions within marriage. And those functions are decided by God, not by us. You know, one of the most frequent complaints of non-believing husbands, you understand what I'm saying? The wife is a Christian, the husband is a non-believer. 
one of the main complaints of non-believing husbands is a Christian wife who uses her faith to hijack his authority where there is no moral or spiritual conflict at all. So a wife who is truly submissive to her husband, the Christian notion of submission, she offers her submission to him as a gift, as an act of faith, encourages him to take on the role of leadership in the family. A woman who's like that is a joy to her husband and an incentive for him to assume his own role as a man. Very important. Secondly, he says, you want to make happy husband? Develop the kind of attitudes that make him happy. In verse two he says, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. So how do you make a, a husband happy? Well, you develop the kind of attitudes that make him happy. And one of those attitudes, Peter says, is chaste. A chaste attitude makes him happy. So what does that mean, chaste? Well, chastity is, a, is an attitude that you have in everything you say and do. It means sexually pure in word and in dress and in action, intention. You know, the Bible tells us that we are free to express our sexuality with our spouse in any way we choose, as we agree. But as free as we are with our partners, we are exclusive and private with other people. So provocative dressing, careless affection, intimate questions and exchanges with others does not build a husband's trust. You know, this, this passage doesn't mean that it's not okay to look good on the outside. He's simply saying that it isn't the outside that makes you beautiful. He's also saying that, in uh, uh, here he's suggesting, of course, that men are easily provoked to jealousy. I'm not saying it's a quality. You know? I'm not saying it's something nice about men, but it's just the way we are. But a wise woman, a chaste woman, will recognize this and build a climate of trust in her husband. She purposefully builds trust in him. You can trust me in everything she says and does, not just with him, but the way she interacts with other men. You know, a man is happy with a wife who is recognized as chaste by other men. Not just himself, but by other men. Other men know there's absolutely no way that they're going to get anywhere with this particular woman here. The, she doesn't flirt, she doesn't, there's no double intention meanings, there's nothing, you know, you got nothing. We can be friends, but our friends, our friendship is in Christian friendship, period. Another pleasing attitude that Peter mentions right here is respectful. It says, as they, the husband, observe your, the wife, chaste, we've talked about that, and respectful behavior. So a respectful wife makes him happy. This means to be restrained in words and action, to be dignified. A respectful wife isn't a wife that says, yes dear, yeah, you're right, yes dear, yes dear. That's, that's not a respectful wife. That's not what he's talking about here. It's an attitude marked by discretion and prudence and wisdom in her opinions and her decisions and the way that she acts is respectful. So a man is happy to have a wife that doesn't make a fool of herself or a fool of him with her words, with her actions. You know. I think today we call it drama. Yeah, a husband is happy with a wife that isn't creating drama all the time. That kind of like a vortex, you know, sucks in everybody around them. And of course, with the advent of Facebook, let's face it. Can we spread drama or can we ever spread drama? So a lot of women, you know, they try to change their husbands when they should really be working on developing themselves in chaste and respectful behavior. You, know, you never change a man by gossiping about his weaknesses to your friends. I see that a lot. A woman will tell her friends or buddies, 
BFF, you know, about her husband's weaknesses or her husband's you know, little things. You know, oh, he's so, you know, I think he's overweight or I think, you know, oh, he's this, he's that. You know, just as girl talk. And they think that the husband like, applauds this, likes this. You never change a man by gossiping about his weaknesses to your friends or putting him down in front of his friends. That's undignified. It's, it's unworthy of a Christian woman. We're not saying the guy's perfect, we're not saying he has no faults, but that's between you and him and God. That's not between you and your friends. And certainly it's not an opportunity to point them out in front of your friends. What makes a man happy, Peter says, number three, cultivate a pleasing appearance. In other words, cultivate an appearance that makes him happy. He says in verse three, your adornment must not be ex uh, merely external, braiding the hair, wearing gold jewelry, or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, the, in the former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any, any fear. So in the beginning, men are attracted by what they see on the outside. That's just, that's life, it's the way it is. But for a happy marriage, the man must continue to be drawn to what he sees on the inside because eventually he kind of gets used to what's on the outside. Don't matter how beautiful you are, he, he kind of gets you, that's the way life is, isn't it? So this passage doesn't mean that it's not okay to look good on the outside, as I was saying before. Peter is simply saying that it isn't the outside that makes you beautiful to him in the long run, it's the inside. He gets used to the outside. And let's face it, what happens to the outside? Well, it deteriorates. I mean, it deteriorates. You know, we're, we're all getting older. You know? I tell people, hey, we're all good looking once. Some of us had hair once. You know what I'm saying? Some of us used to fit in a size six once. And then the babies came, right? So the outside, you know, the outside, it, it deteriorates. All you can do is maybe slow it down and camouflage it. But God sees and He works on the inside of a woman. And internal beauty is defined in verses four to six. And this is what internal beauty consists of, according to Peter, I just read it to you before. First of all, he says, a gentle and a quiet spirit. Remember now where we're at, you know. What's inside? What's beauty on the inside? What, what does it consist of? Well, Peter says a gentle and quiet spirit. This means not to be proud or stubborn. God works on this proud and stubborn spirit by asking a woman to submit to an imperfect man. You ever wonder how God works with women? How does God work? We know how He works with men a lot of times, but He works with women in a special way. He says, your role in the family is to be in submission to your husband. What? What? That guy? Being in submission to an imperfect man creates a lot of humility in the proud spirit of a woman. I mean, nothing creates a humble spirit more effectively than having to submit to an imperfect man. Nothing, no exercise can do it better than that. So God doesn't want women to submit to their husbands because their husbands are better. He asks this as a demonstration of love to him and to maintain order in the family. So when a woman is being in submission to her husband, what she is saying is not, you're better than me, so I'm going to sit. No, she's saying, I love the Lord and I understand what the Lord is asking of me in my relationship with you. And I accept that and I offer it to you in love. And a man who has any sense at all will receive that from his wife as a precious gift and be very, very, very 
careful with it. So gentle and quiet spirit, that's beautiful. And it's right before God. And it makes a husband happy, happy in his soul. Peter also mentions doing what is right. Inner beauty consists of doing what is right. Being a righteous person in family relationships, in business, in church, to seek and do the right thing, this is beautiful to behold. You know, in a personal experience, I, I can always count on my wife to want to do the right thing. She always wants to do the right thing. And a lot of times I'm the guy, you know, like the, the, the sulking teenager that goes, okay, all right, let's do it. You know. Hey, look, they're doing this thing and we can go and we can help and let's give money to that. No, 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 we're already giving money. You know? But it's a beautiful quality in her. She runs towards doing what is right. She's eager, she's pulling against the, you know, to, to get to do something good. And that's a beautiful, beautiful quality in her. And it humbles me. I'm thinking, man, I'm the preacher and I'm the sluggard in the back trying to keep up with her. And he mentions also the fact that uh, inner beauty consists not only of a gentle spirit and doing what is right, but a woman who has no fear. I'm not talking about a woman who knows how to hang, handle a 45. No, I'm not talking about that. Not the foolish bravado of today when people say no fear you know, on a t-shirt. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't understand how easily you can die. I mean, you know, are we watching TV? You know, the mudslide, one minute you're drinking coffee in your kitchen and, and 60 seconds later you've just been buried by you know, 40 feet of mud. So this business of no fear and I risk that stuff, you know, that's, that's crazy. You can die very, very quickly in this life. No, no, not afraid, Peter says, because like Sarah, a woman's faith is in God, not herself, not her husband, not her abilities. Not afraid because she is ready to meet evil and failure and disappointment and even death with the assurance that Christ will be with her at all times. That's the kind of no fear I'm talking about. I'm not afraid of the future because God is in the future. He's with me now and He will be with me in the future no matter what happens. I'm not going to be afraid. That doesn't mean I'm not going to be concerned. That's not, that doesn't mean I'm not going to plan for, make contingencies and so on and so forth. It doesn't mean that. It just means one of the, one of the feelings that I'm not going to have is to be afraid. So the appearance that makes the man happy, the husband happy, begins with a pleasing exterior, but will only last if the interior is cultivated as well. So let me summarize the first part of this lesson. Peter gives wives three very specific ways to make their husbands happy. First of all, learn what submission actually means. Discuss it with him. I challenge wives to actually have a conversation with your husbands and ask him the question, do you feel that I am you know, really in submission to you? I don't know how many times that question's been asked in a marriage, but it should be. How well am I being in submission to you? How could I improve that spiritual quality that I'm, I mean, I care about being a submissive wife because this is what God wants from me. How well am I doing? And believe it or not, not just Christian wives talking to Christian husbands, but Christian wives even talking to husbands who are non-believers. You, <laughs> you want to send him for a loop? Ask him that question. Secondly, cultivate an attitude of chastity and respect. Ask him if he thinks you are and how you can change to be more so. Do you, do you, do you trust me? Ask him that. Do you trust me? Do you have complete trust in me? Do you know that I would never in any way compromise our relationship with someone else? I mean, do you know that? Ask him. 
And then finally, and this isn't all, mind you, I'm just picking this one scripture because it says so much in so few words. Concentrate on the inner woman rather than the outer woman. Invest more time in spiritual exercises and study and doing good work. Again, that doesn't mean you want to go run, go run, go jog, go to the gym, that's fine. But are you spending more time on that type of thing? You know, my hair, my jewelries, my clothing, shopping, blah, blah, blah. Am I spending more time on that or all my time on that and not even have a moment to just be quiet and read the, God's word or have a, a quiet moment, simply me and the Lord just talking back and forth about things or involved in some kind of service to the Lord's church, you know? Is everything I do just for the exterior or am I investing something to develop the interior? Because if you do, these things will beautify you in God's eyes and in your husband's eyes as well. All right. Well, as I said at the beginning, Peter was a happy husband because he knew how to make his wife happy. Now he goes on in 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 7 to give some basic ideas on how to make your wife happy, talking to the husbands. And what's interesting is he only has one verse for the guys because they have a short attention span. To, to the women he gives six verses, to the guys just one verse, you know. So how do you make your wife happy, according to Peter? Well, number one, he says, live with your wife. He says, you husbands, in the same way, live with your wives. Would seem kind of normal. What do you mean live with my wife? Of course I live with my wife. We have the same house. We live over here on Choctaw Road. What's the problem here? Now some husbands think that living with their wives means simply sharing the same bed and house with them legally. But the word with here in the Greek means to be closely aligned, to be settled with. And so the mistake that many men make is that they become passive in their marriage. They say things like this, okay, well my job is the office or the church or the shop or whatever, that's my job. And your job is the home and the kids. Even if you have another job, you know, the wife, your job is the home and the kids. And a lot of us, you know, a little older, we were kind of raised to think this way. But this is not God's way of living with our wives. In 1 Timothy, you don't have to go there, I just want to refer to the scripture. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4 and 5, Paul says that elders, you know when he's giving the qualifications of elders in the church, one of the things is of course a, a person who's going to be a leader in the church, an elder is going to be married, so he's talking to husbands there. He says husbands must manage their households well. So if you want to be an elder in the church, one of the things, you, there are many other things, but one of the things is you must manage your household well. Notice he doesn't say uh, if you want to be an elder in the church, you've got to manage your business well or your finances well. He doesn't say that. And it's interesting because I've seen in the church, I've been to a lot of meetings where you know, there's a discussion about who's going to be an elder and the other elders are talking about qualifications and they're throwing names around. Oh yeah, Bob, what about Bob? Yeah, Bob, man, he has, he has a plumbing business, he's got three locations, the guy's got money, he knows about construction, he'd be a perfect elder. Really? Nothing against Bob and the plumbing business, but there's nothing in the Bible that says you have to be successful in business in order to be a leader in the Lord's church. It says you have to manage your household well. Doesn't matter how you manage your business, you have to manage your household well. So what does this mean for a man to manage his household well? Well, first of all, it means you need to know what's going on in your house. And you need to ensure that the needs, the emotional, spiritual and physical needs are being met for every member of your household. You are in charge of that. And we know what happens when we don't do that. Isaac and Jacob in the Old Testament, for example, both had problems in their households because they didn't manage the situations in their homes well. It also means that husbands cultivate relationships with the persons in their house. It's like 
I've seen this so many times, you know. Well, mom's, mom's job is to kind of know about the three kids, you know, one boy and two little girls. She knows everything that's going on with them, so on and so forth. Then when he comes home, she tells him everything. And if it's good, he'll pay for the reward. And if it's bad, he'll do the spanking. That's not a relationship. That's not a relationship. A relationship is dad knows what's going on with little Bobby and little Susie and little Mary. He knows what's going on. You know why? Because he talks to them and he finds out what's going on. And you're saying, yeah, but he's at work all day. Yeah, so? You know, a little less March Madness, a little more talking to the kids. You know what I'm saying? Because after March Madness, what, what, what other sport is going to start soon? Football and after baseball and there's always something to take your attention away from building a relationship with your, with your children. Good home management also requires a plan for growth for all the individuals in the family. Leadership in the home means not just, hey, I'm the boss, we're going to do it my way, it's my way or the highway, the Bible says so. No. Leadership means you're responsible for the growth, the spiritual, emotional, <coughs> physical growth of every person in your family. That's what leadership is all about. Oh, I noticed that Mary seems to have a skill you know, for math or something like that, and you talk to your wife, what do you say we kind of really help her cultivate that? You know, maybe there's a math club we can send her to or get, you know what I'm saying? That kind of that development. And the youth group at church is going to Mexico this summer on a, on a thing. Why don't we save some money? And you know, Johnny's old enough now, he could go on a thing like that. And we're, we're going to talk to him about that, try to get him encouraged to, you know, that type of planning for the growth of the kids. And good home management also means they're involved in what happens at the house. They don't just come home to be served and then go back out to tend to their hobbies. You know, come home, relax, read the paper, eat supper, go out in the garage and work on the car. I mean, we all do something like that. All of us have things. But if that's your routine, if all you hear in the house uh, are the kids saying to mom, I mean, what is that? He's a, and, and mommy is saying, Shh, don't bother him. You know, when he's, when, he's on, when he's working on the car in the garage, he doesn't like to be bothered. Well, I tell you dads who do that, when he's 17 and you want to talk to him, that'll come back and bite you. Because if you don't cultivate a relationship when he's eight, you won't have one when he's 18, and then you'll really want one. You'll really need to talk to him then. So the management and development of the house is the husband's top priority because this is what he's judged on, not how well he managed his business. God, God's not going to care. Well, I shouldn't say that. He wants us to be good stewards of everything, but the priority thing that he wants from us as men, as fathers, as leaders, is how well did we manage our family. Home is not just a pit stop. Home is the destination. So passive husbands, who see their wives as you know, mothers more than wives, they're the, they're the biggest complaint when marriage gets, uh, marriages get into trouble. The, the, the thing I hear is, I can't get them to you know, get involved. I can't get them to do anything with the kids. I can't get them to do any of that stuff. And what happens is the wife takes over the leadership of the home. And then that just throws everything out of kilter. A wife is happiest and feels wonderful when her husband lives with her in the home, managing their growth to God's glory. Second idea Peter develops in the connection to happy wives is know your wife. He says, in an understanding way as with someone weaker since she is a woman. So Peter says that the husband should treat her in an understanding way, know her. Now the original version is this one here, live with your wife according to knowledge. You know, women are usually more complex, more sensitive than men, and men, you know, we like this about them. This is what contributes to their tenderness and their mystique and their mystery. It's what draws us to them. They're not, they're not men, <laughs> they're women, they're different than us. However, 
there's not a downside, but there's another side to this. Because they are in this way, more complex emotionally than we are, it requires an effort to understand them. I'm going to tell you something to, to the men here. I want you to, if you forget everything, I want you to remember what I'm going to say. Very important. The success you have in making your wife happy is in direct proportion to your knowledge of her. The success you have in, you want to make your wife happy, how happy she is is in direct proportion to how well you know her. Let me explain. The best compliment that your wife can give you is not, oh, you big and strong, and oh, I like your big truck. You have such a big truck. Oh, V8, I'm so, oh, I'm so excited. You have a V8. Oh, big tires. That, that's not the con. Oh, you did a great job on the lawn. I like the way the hedge is, you know? That's not the best compliment your wife can give you. The best compliment that your wife can give you is, you know me so well, don't you? When your wife looks at you guys and she said, you rascal, you know me so well. That's the ultimate compliment that you can receive from your wife. It's important for you, uh, for your wife rather, to know that you are really, really interested in knowing her and not just interested in getting something from her. See the difference? I want to know you, not just I want you to give me something. And we usually know what that something is, isn't it? Don't we? You can usually tell when a woman is unhappy. She's the woman sharing all of her cares and concerns with everybody else except her husband. Everybody else knows her business except her husband. That's the unhappy woman. And that's the woman who has a husband who has not made the proper effort to know her. So the things that you do, men, to make her happy are really the things that you have to do in order to know her. You see what I'm saying? It's not about, oh, I bring chocolates, I buy, whoop, Valentine's, oh, wait a minute, that's, oh, that's chocolate and flower day, boom. Her birthday, uh oh, that's jewelry day, boom. That, the things you have to do, apart from those giving gifts and whatever, the thing you have to do to make her happy are all those things that you do to get to know her as a person. For example, a willingness to share and listen to her dreams, to her problems, how she sees life. So a guy says, well, I don't, you know, that's not, you know, you're, you're reading a paper, you know, yes, dear. Yes, dear. I'm listening, I'm listening. I can do two things at once. Yes, dear. You know, that's not really listening. You know that someone's listening to you. You know how you know someone's really listening to you? They're asking questions. They're asking questions. What do you mean by that? Or when did you first start feeling that way? Or am I like that? You, know, you ask questions. That's how you get to know stuff. Also an ability to be transparent and open with her. Believe it or not, she wants to know you and what you're thinking. And your ability to open up and let her know the good and the bad and the ugly, that is also a way of getting to know how she reacts to you. A readiness to forgive, of course. Because she may say things, she may, when she opens up and shows you who she really is, you may need to exercise some level of forgiveness here. And I don't mean forgiving some huge sin, just forgiving and being patient with a particular quality of character that is difficult for you to accept. And of course, sensitivity and the ability to anticipate her needs. For example, it's a long day, she's got the kids, she's run to school to pick one up and then she had to go to the doctor's appointment with the second one and she's dragging all two with her and then getting some, she had to stop by and pick up the, the prescriptions for the kids and it's been going, going, going. And you also, you've been busy at work too, you know, you've been working too, but you know what her day is like and then on your way home you figure, you know what, you pick up some pizza and some bread strips, uh, you know, uh, uh, breadsticks and uh, you know, some pop, whatever, you know, and you bring it all home, you put it on the table, you get there before her, 
and she comes in <clears throat> and you're saying, you know what, I knew this was going to be a hard day for you, busy, busy, we're, we're both busy. Ah, you know, I didn't want you to go through the whole hassle of cooking, why don't we just have the pizza tonight? It's not about the pizza and the drink. It's about the idea that you thought of me and you anticipated my feelings and you anticipated my need and you met my need and I didn't have to say a single word. This goes a long way, not just with women, but certainly with our wives. So these are the kind of activities that help you really know your wife and consequently they are the same activities that make her happy. Working on these things will increase your appreciation of her and it'll increase not only her appreciation for you men, but it will also increase her desire for you. All right, number three. Happy wives, live with your wife, know your wife, honor your wife. Verse 7c, it says, and show her honor as a fellow heir of grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. Now the Greek word translated honor here uh, has the connotation of something being precious. So you grant or you assign to her a precious role in your life. You demonstrate this with your actions. So Peter, you know, he provides two reasons why you should do this. First of all, he says, it's the right use of your natural strength. You know, he says, because she's the weaker vessel, that doesn't mean she's dumb. It means physically, obviously women, they weigh less, not as big as men. Physically, they're not as strong as men. So she is precious to you. She has a different nature uh, than you do, but she is equal in value, not to do so, would make you a hypocrite before God, and thus your prayers would be, would be hindered. You know, we, should, we should wonder how many of our prayers, men, are not heard because of the way that we treat our, we treat our wives. Now this passage speaks to believers and assumes that they do pray to God, and so dishonoring their wives, making her less precious, so to speak, would spoil that man's prayer life. So how do we dishonor our wives? Well, we do it, I would say, in two ways. We have too low or too high an opinion of her. Some treat their wives without any respect or consideration. That's too low. And others put her on a pedestal or are improperly submitted to their wife's leadership. That's too high. So we need to understand that, you know, how do we properly honor our wives? Number one, recognize and respect her weaker physical frame by not using your strength to intimidate her, but rather to serve her and protect her. That's what your strength is for, men. Not to, not to intimidate her my way or else, but to use that strength to protect her. Also, telling her how much you appreciate what she does, compliments, encourage her in her work, in her appearance, in her ideas. You know, just paying the rent doesn't communicate your respect. Communicating your respect is actually telling her, I think you're doing a great job with the kids. Or I appreciate the fact that when I work overtime, you, know, you, you make supper and keep it warm for me. I really do appreciate when I come home, there's a meal for me, even though everybody's eaten and gone on to other things. Thank you. I mean, it, it, you know, it doesn't have to be phony stuff. Real things. Treat her with respect in front of other people. Do not reveal her faults. Do not ridicule her. Do not bring her down. Do not make her feel uncomfortable. I've seen some men, you know, they point out little weaknesses in their husbands you know, when they're in mixed company and they go, oh, I'm just kidding, I'm just joking. No, don't do that. Only say and do those things that build her up in front of others. If there's an issue, you know, something you don't like, whatever it is, keep that for you and her. Nothing is more unpleasant than a man who lifts himself up in public at the expense of his wife. That's disrespectful. Also, how about doing some of the dirty work? Show her 
that you consider her precious by doing that dirty work without being asked. Now some people say, well, you know, the guys say, well, I do dirty work, man, I change the oil on the car and I, you know, I, I get the John Deere out and I do the lawning, lawn mowing, yeah, sure. Here, let me give you an example of dirty work, okay? So you're at church, right? You got three little kiddos running around all over the place and church is over, right? So you, the guy, say to your wife, hey, you, you keep talking to your friends, I'll go get the kids. I'll wrangle the kids and keep them close by so you can visit with your friends. And when we're ready to go, I'll, I'll load them up in the car for a change. That's that dirty, how about that dirty work? You know, I have a thing here, I think we've got about two minutes left. Well, we don't have any time left, but let me, if you permit me, let me just read you this thing, it takes about 30 seconds. It's called Men's Idea of Cooking. You ready for this? Men's Idea of Cooking, okay. It's the only type of cooking a real man will do. When a man volunteers to do such cooking, the following chain events is put into practice. You ready? Stage number one, the woman goes to the store. Don't forget, this is men cooking now. Stage number two, the woman fixes the salad, the vegetables, and the dessert. Stage number three, the woman prepares the meat for cooking, places it on a tray along with the necessary cooking utensils. As he calls through the closed door, are the steaks ready yet? And she takes the steaks to the man who is lounging beside the grill. Stage number five, the woman goes inside to set the table, check the vegetables. Stage number six, the woman comes back out to tell the man that the meat is burning. <laughs> Stage number seven, the man takes the meat off the grill and hands it to the woman. Stage number eight, the woman prepares the plates and brings them to the table. Stage number nine, after eating, the woman clears the table and does the dishes. Stage number 10, the man asks the woman how she enjoyed her night off. And upon seeing her annoyed reaction concludes that there's just no pleasing some women. Little tongue in cheek. One last thing here before we shut down this lesson. <laughs> Demonstrate your appreciation. Demonstrate to her that she is precious by offering her, sure, the little gifts, the surprised outing, notes, cards, lover's weekend, things that you do to show her how important she is. A woman who is confident that her husband honors her above all else and is continually reminded of this by a loving husband will more happily and easily be in submission to him. If a husband does these things that I've just talked about, what woman has a problem with being in submission to such a man? Marriages you know, may be made in heaven, but man is responsible for the maintenance work here on earth. So to, to conclude, the secret to maintaining a happy marriage is found in the notion that when you make your wife feel wonderful to be your wife, you empower her to make your life a happy experience as a husband. And God has put into your hands the responsibility of making her feel wonderful. Be involved, men. Don't just visit your house. Number two, make the effort to know your wife better than anyone else. I'll tell you something. If if anyone knows your wife better than you do, something's wrong. Because you're the expert on your wife. I tell people, I'm the expert on Lee's. Other than her parents who are long gone, but I'm the expert on Lee's. Nobody knows her like I know her, and I make it my business to know her better than anyone else. And then finally, in everything you say and do, let her see that you consider her the most precious person in your life. Truly a gift from God. Well, that's the end of our series, In Love for Life, for this particular one. Thank you for your attention. Uh, this material will be available on DVD, so you can share it again, share it with others who may have uh, not seen the uh, series, or perhaps you can pick up some lessons that you missed yourself. Thank you very much, and God bless you, and God bless your marriages.